cyber violence. We constantly stressed the Roosevelt New Deal for a better farm and labor programs. I personally met with several other governors with Franklin Roosevelt to continue the work relief programs in 37 when some of the uh, advisors mistakenly thought that the depression was over and the federal aid should be shut off. Franklin D. Elmer told us, told a few stories, and then he left before they got down to the real nitty gritty. And uh, they, they had to reinstitute those program because the depression wasn't over. That you know, was wishful thinking. Historians such as Miller no doubt are expected to second guess the decisions and behavior of the people they study. If this is the case, they should tell others why he, uh, sh he would have stood, he should have said where he would have stood on the deep divisions in American society in the 30s in both foreign and domestic areas. The suggestion is made several times that the farm labor defeat in 38 could be laid to my lack of sense of humor. This is pretty superficial in my opinion. It was no joking matter for a farmer to go through the bankrupt through bankruptcy or to know the sorrow in families without jobs or face the prospect of having sending boys to another European war after the idealism of World War I seemed so hollow. Admittedly, I was not a stand-up comedian in those days. But I don't think this is the function of a political leader, then or now. I remember a guy that was a kind of a comedian, Huey Long, in 1935, I went with John Innesvet and a few other right-wingers to the uh, National Convention of the Holiday Association in uh, Des Moines. And that Huey, he was something. Uh, the reporters met him in the, in the hotel, in his room, and he was sitting in the middle of the bed in a very colorful uh, pajamas, and one of them says, uh, Mr. Long, isn't it true that you, uh, that you come here to see the queens that re Drake relays? Huey says, let's say that's a happy coincidence. That was on at the same time that the holiday convention was. And he didn't like Henry Wallace. He had to have a scapegoat. So Huey gets up there and he says, no, the real Solomon, Psalm in 1935, in the year of our Lord, Cornwallis. <laughs> he called him Cornwallis. So he, he was, a, but he had all the earmarks to me of a dictator. He could have been a fascist dictator. The year before, they had Father Coughlin, who was, oh, toward the last, he was talking about the corporate state. Hitler told, told some truth, and the same with Huey. I'm not comparing Huey with Hitler, but you mix some truths and half-truths and some lies, and some of it sounds good. It's bound to sound good. Oh, I think I've said enough here. Uh, you know, if you want to ask me some questions, I can do that. Elmer told me to bring his con uh, greetings to the convention. Jimmy Youngdale has better done that a hundred times better than I can. And, uh, and that tape the other night, I thought that was terrific. That's the kind of men we had. Floyd Olson, they defied him to, uh, to call out the, uh, the guard to uh, prevent bloodshed during the truck driver strike in 34, five, local 544. And boy, that was organized, that strike. They, they had their own first aid station set up. They had doctors, they had nurses there. A few years ago, a couple of years ago on the educational channel, it showed uh, the strikers and it showed Floyd Olson walking in and out of the strike headquarters and putting his arm around the strikers. I don't see our Uncle Albert Quee up in Minnesota <laughs> going into the strike quarters and putting his arm around the strikers. His ambition, I'll tell you the mentality of that guy, he, uh, 
led 200 horsemen up a river in Minnesota that the DNR had posted all over that you couldn't use horses. And he says his ambition is every governor gets his picture painted and hung in the Capitol. It'll be there forever, which is a long time. And uh, he wants his picture taken with a cowboy hat on. <laughs> when my boy was six years old, that's what he wanted. Thank you, Roy. Next, I'd like to introduce Don Tigland. Don was born on a farm near Lyon, in Lyon County, Minnesota in 1911. He attended Augsburg College in Minneapolis, uh, during which he witnessed the bitter battles between the Teamsters and the Minneapolis Police Force. Later, he migrated to Moline, Illinois, looking for employment, and he began his career as a production worker at International Harvester in 1936. There, he became deeply involved in organizing workers, and in 1940, he helped celebrate the first contract between, the International, between International Harvester and uh, the uh, Factory Equipment Workers Union. He was elected to the Illinois General Assembly in, for the 1943-1944 term, and in 1948, uh, Don was uh, on the Progressive Party ballot as uh, an electoral candidate for Henry Wallace. At this time, uh, Don and his wife, Don retired from International Harvesters in 1973, and at, th at this time, Don and his wife, Marguerite, are now active in adv advocacy programs for the aging in Rock Island County. I'll now turn it over to Don. I'd like to start out by expressing my appreciation to uh, Marilyn and for and Dixon for the invitation to come here today. The wife and I have been here for three days. And after listening for three days, I can't imagine anything more to say. It just seems like it should be almost impossible. But we have another panel coming up after this one. Uh, so I think we aren't through yet. Just to add a little bit to what uh, Dixon said about uh, my background, my grandparents, this is similar to, uh, to uh, Merle Hansen. Uh, my grandparents came over from Norway too, and they settled right out here uh, by Story City in the 1850s. And then in 1863 or 64, they got in a wagon, team of horses, one boy and one girl, I think the boy was about nine, the girl about six, and they took the trip up to Minnesota and settled in Lyon County. That was a, about a 300 mile trip, it took them 30 days. Uh, I say that by way of illustrating how times change, how history moves on, and uh, we just sort of have a time keeping up. Uh, it's true, I did spend three years in Minneapolis at Augsburg, sort of sheltered from everything, including the Depression, the New Deal program with its NYA, uh, sort of financed part of my schooling, and the rest was working in a restaurant downtown, and it was there that I observed the Teamsters strike. It was my introduction to uh, to a trade union, to the struggle of workers, and to a politician that seemed to be on the workers' side, and that was Floyd Olson. Even on the conservative campus of Augsburg, amongst the students, uh, Floyd Olson excited their interest in Minneapolis politics. After going to school for three years, I better, figured I'd better find work, and I tried and tried walking up and down the streets of Minneapolis. There was nothing. Uh, bear in mind now, this is 1936. And then I heard through some grapevine that seems to pass words along that the farm equipment industry uh, in the Quad Cities was putting on men. Uh, so I hitchhiked down there and spent another four months looking for work, and finally, they got on at 
the East Moline Works of International Harvester and spent the next 37 years, uh, from which I retired, as he mentioned, in, in 73. What I wanted to say uh, as my contribution to this discussion is a, a little description of uh, the life of a displaced farm boy. Uh, we've heard about him several times during the, the three days we've been here, the, the displaced agricultural uh, person that there's nothing on the farm anymore, so he has to get off uh, and find work on a, some kind of a non-farm occupation. And a good many of them came to uh, the Quad Cities during the 30s uh, from the little town of Ghent and Minneota. Uh, I think at one time there were 30, 30 young men that came down hitchhiking, catching rides and so forth, and found work in the deer factories or in the international harvester factories. And this is multiplied by the hundreds uh, throughout industry, that uh, as many as could found work. But what a change for a, uh, for a farm boy that is used to the, the freedom of a farm. Uh, and there is considerable freedom on a farm, even though there's a lot of work too. Uh, but the, uh, the discipline and the regimentation of factory work was hard to take. And I suppose that over the years, many of the farm boys couldn't take it, got fired, and uh, drifted back homeward. I thought I'd tell you a little about the first uh, period in the shop uh, to indicate some other things uh, that was taking place. The farm machine industry at that time had been down for about three or four years with no work, and they were just picking up. Uh, one familiar sight I saw as I walked into the plant, and this plant incidentally it covers about uh, 30 acres of land under one roof. But uh, a familiar sight was the uh, International Harvester stationary threshing machine being worked on, being pushed through the, they had what they might call the push and pull system of, of uh, production. They would push this tractor, or this uh, threshing machine into another station and put on some parts and then push it on a little further and another group of guys would put on something else. Uh, one example would be the straw blower or the stacker as they called it. In those days the, the straw stacker uh, was uh, bolted and riveted and they had a big gang, the straw, straw what do they call them? The, uh, straw stacker gang, about 30 guys working on each piece because there was so much riveting to do by hand. Just uh, maybe three years later, the uh, straw or the uh, stationary thresher had been replaced by the first combines. Uh, the straw stacker had been replaced by the straw walker. And farmers uh, know what these terms refer to, the thing that walks the straw through the machine and drops it out in the back. But the big change was in how we put it together. In the meantime, the spot welder had come into the shop, and this took the place of riveting. And for example, we'd, we'd have a fixture about the size of that table. All the parts would be put, put into the fixture, uh, and then the operator, one person, instead of the 30, would hit the button, and in less than a second, all these pieces had been welded in place. And he would take it out and hang it on the conveyor, and it was gone. 30 guys, one guy doing the work of 30, that's really what happened. And this is multiplied all through the shop, and it's a, it's a common occurrence that when a union well, I better say first, we didn't have a union. There was a, a company union of types, but it was absolutely of no value. So our first real job was to get a union. It, it, took, uh, it took almost four years before we got our first contract. 
But what I was going to say about uh, the production, that every time you have a strike and win something, uh, the uh, next thing you look for is what changes are coming into place. Because the companies will do everything conceivable to make up for anything they might lose. And uh, I might point out that the International Harvester Company has been struck now for four and a half months. Uh, they weren't back to work when I left last Thursday. I don't know, or last uh, Monday, I should say. I don't know if they're back yet. The reason that the strike has been going on all this time is the insistence by the workers to retain the right to accept or decline overtime work. And there's a long history behind that, of course. Uh, I think we noticed it in the, in the Debs picture, uh, this, the battle that the workers put up for a shorter work week. It cut down the work week from uh, seven days to five, and the work day from 10 hours to eight. And it took a lot of battles and a lot of fighting to get that. They finally did. And now the company is uh, determined that they're going to take that privilege away. And the strike has been continuing for four months. I believe the guys will, will win. They may have to give up something, but not that. I was supposed to speak also on the question of farm labor movement. But the thought was that I should speak about something a little different than the political movements, such as the uh, Farmer Labor Party in Minnesota, uh, the progressives, and so forth in Wisconsin. Uh, and that is the efforts by, in some communities, to have a kind of a liaison between the factory worker and the farmer. It may be a selfish interest. I've been on so many strikes uh, against the International Harvester that it's even hard to count them. Uh, but that in every time we're out on strike, uh, we have to kind of compete with the company in their efforts to uh, alienate the farmer. Uh, I remember back in 1948, we had a rather bitter strike. And the company was putting in ads in the paper, uh, ridiculing our demands for more pay, and bringing in the farm angle that uh, if we raised prices too much, uh, it would boomerang and the farmer would not buy the product. The old scare about uh, getting laid off. So we uh, thought, well, well, let's go to the farmers and see if we can't bring them into this thing. Uh, so we got a hold of Charlie Dengler in, in Scott County uh, many of you might know him. And he was very happy to, to work with us on it. So we developed a program where we went out in the country to the IH dealers and bought up different items, uh, you know, that you can buy in, uh, parts with the price that the dealer was charging. And then we took these back home and put the program on television with Dengler and one of his boys working with us. And we took the piecework price that we uh, as workers were getting to make this part and explained it very carefully to the public. And it was, it was really devastating to the company to find that uh, a part, you know, that we get paid maybe 10 cents a hundred to make that they in turn were permitting their dealer to charge, uh, say, a dollar a piece or a dollar a part. Uh, and it showed, uh, if anything, it showed the value added through uh, human labor to a piece of uh, metal. So it gave us uh, some lesson in, in economics. But that kind of relationship with the farmers uh, wasn't really enough. Fred Stover, I know, he wanted to have an organization. And uh, Lem Harris, he, he was around wanting to see if the farmers and the workers couldn't actually establish some kind of working relations together. 
Uh, and through LEM, we, uh, as the Farm Equipment Workers Union, hired Homer Ayers, a rancher from South Dakota, to come in and be, go on the staff of the union, to go around to all of our different uh, district meetings and our steward meetings and tell them about the, the concern of the farmer, the family farm, and how we were really more united than we might have thought we were. So we did set up a farmer labor alliance or farmer labor meetings, committee meetings in different places, three or four in, in Iowa, uh, one down in Canton, Illinois, another one in the Quad Cities. And we would have meetings and bring in speakers. I think we had Fred Stover into one in East Moline. But then the, the old problem that the, even the Democrat or the Farmer Labor Party in Minnesota experienced, uh, I belonged to the Farm Equipment Workers Union, which was in those days considered left wing. In order to strengthen our position, we joined with the United Electrical Workers, which was left wing. And the battles began all through the labor movement the 1948-49, our union supported Wallace, the rest of the unions didn't. So it was one of those uh, kind of things that all of you are familiar with. The end result was that these efforts at farmer labor development got sidetracked because of our fight to remain as a union because we fought for two, three years to uh, maintain our identity. The UE still does. The Farm Equipment Workers Union went down the drain. Then the people like Grant Oaks and uh, Jerry Field and so forth found work elsewhere. We didn't lose our union. It became uh, transferred to the United Auto Workers. And ever since then, we've been Auto Workers Union in the farm equipment industry. And it's uh, through that, and that's a powerful union. Through that union, uh, we maintain our relationships with companies and uh, doing a good job of fighting for the, for the workers. But we don't have the old philosophy that uh, sort of led us into alliances with the farmer. I hope someday soon that this kind of union program uh, will become a part of the, uh, the aim of workers, and because I think it might be important. I don't know whether the... I wrote a little question here because I think it might be a p something for us to consider. Uh, if it is true, and it seems to be, that the basic trend in both agriculture and industry is toward larger and larger units, that is the farms and the factories, with more and more mechanization and automation, should we be considering means of reversing these trends? Or is it irreversible? Now, there's one is negative and the other is positive. And if there is a means of reversing these trends, I think that that is the area in which we might see some progress from this three-day meeting we've had. I had a couple of quotes that I wanted to read. One was one from Common Sense, Tom Paine, when he said, on the eve of the American Revolution, Tom Paine wrote in his famous pamphlet, Common Sense, that a long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right. And that ties in with A statement that I found in uh, a fellow by the name of Brechter. I don't know the guy, but he wrote a book, Common Sense for Hard Times. And he says, we believe that today the time has come for a complete end to the power of owners, managers, politicians, and bureaucrats over the lives of the majority who must now work for them. This power may superficially appear to be legitimate, simply because it has so long been accepted. But today, it guarantees impoverishment and oppression for the majority of our society. 
the opportunity to declare its independence from that power, indeed the chance to abolish it, lies in the hands of, the, of that majority. That's a rather strong statement. And it ties in with this poem by Berthold Brecht. Those who take the meat from the table teach contentment. Those for whom taxes are destined demand sacrifice. Those who eat their fill speak to the hungry of wonderful times to come. And those who lead the country into the abyss call ruling too difficult for ordinary people. Thank you, Don. Now, before uh, we open it up for questions and discussion from uh, out there, I'd like to call down uh, Jeff Stansberry. He's the organizer with UAW out of Detroit, and uh, he's going to tell us a little about a recent uh, successful alliance between uh, farmers and organized labor in Missouri. Jeff? Thank you. What I want to say right now has very much to do with Missouri and what happened there a year and a half ago, and that's to say that I'm very thankful for the opportunity to have been educated by so many of you over the last two and a half days. When I went into Missouri with other people from the United Auto Workers, and I'm not basically an organizer, I'm a, I'm a writer, uh, but on this one I did some organizing, uh, it was my hope uh, having perceived from a distance anyways an objective basis of unity between uh, the uh, 54 or 55 percent of Missouri's farms that are 180 acres or less and the working class on the right to work issue. I went in hoping to be part of uh, persuading farmers to see that and vote against right to work and what I got instead was an education in trade unionism by farmers in grains a milo this high. Uh, having flown all over uh, Missouri in a small plane. So I want to just uh, talk with you very briefly about uh, the uh, attempt, the successful attempt, surprising to many but not to some of us, to uh, defeat right to work in Missouri. Uh, in the uh, winter preceding 1970, the fall of 78, uh, the right to work movement came into Missouri with a plan to uh, try first in the legislature and knowing it would fail there to go by ballot into all of the people of Missouri uh, to uh, repeal the, the uh, uh, anti right to work situation that exists in Missouri now to enact a uh, right to work law. Right to work uh, is a very um, deceptive phrase and uh, initially the polling that was done in the late summer of uh, 78 indicated that if uh, the referendum had been held uh, say in August that uh, two out of every three people in Missouri who voted would have voted uh, for uh, right to work namely for uh, getting rid of uh, the uh, union shop and for forcing unions to bargain collectively for all workers in the unit to hire lawyers, if need be, go out on strike, uh, but uh, to collect uh, union dues only from those who care to pay. It was a direct attack on the uh, labor movement in Missouri. And uh, the right to work people basically use the Statue of Liberty and the notion of freedom in the workplace, to freedom to work without a union as a cover for their attack on the unions while professing that they weren't really going after unions as such. The uh, literature was full of things like this, the Statue of Liberty, all over Missouri, uh, on radio, TV. They called into every home that they could in Missouri, uh, reach to uh, line up the vote against right to work. And in the last days of the campaign, they uh, hit very hard on union corruption and the labor bosses and so forth. Those of us who went into Missouri uh, were very optimistic, actually. Uh, most of the labor movement's reaction to, to uh, the right to work threat was uh, something like this. You know, when uh, they heard the right to work committee was coming into Missouri, and uh, 
it's part of the times. Labor has been defeated very consistently in uh, the national legislature on things like uh, common situs, uh, other legislation, national health care, and so forth. And the mood generally was that this was a loser, but we ought to give it some effort. And uh, those of us who went down there um, were very optimistic because we felt that uh, in an alliance with the small farmers of Missouri and with blacks in the cities and uh, the women's movement, that uh, right to work could be defeated. And I want to just speak briefly about uh, the work that was done with farmers uh, in that campaign. The uh, referendum people thought they would lose in the cities but win big in, in uh, rural Missouri. And uh, uh, as I say, they, they probably would have won early on, not because farmers were inherently anti-labor, but because of the deceptiveness of that particular issue and the slogans. What we did, uh, first of all, was what the rank and file did. The rank and file won the whole battle in Missouri long before any of the leadership uh, was in motion. The rank and file was demanding that uh, labor leaders act, uh, mobilize, get the people out, uh, register for the vote, and so forth. And that was uh, bubbling along for months before the labor leadership finally decided it couldn't win it in the courts, it lost it in the courts, and was going to have to go to the people. And uh, as Don has just indicated, uh, as in my background too, I've, I've yanked, uh, had to yank calves out of cows uh, with chains when their heads were twisted around on their flanks and dodge snakes coming up on hay loaders. And Don has made uh, that sort of a transition too. In Missouri and in many other states, uh, many auto workers and many workers in general in industry uh, are not only off the farm, but they may still be farming part time, and many have brothers, sisters, mothers. Uh, and other relatives who are still working the farms. And even before anything was organized from above in Missouri on weekends, uh, the industrial workers were going back into uh, the dirt road countryside of Missouri, putting up anti-right to work signs, talking with uh, farm families so that you could uh, drive down a dirt road in Missouri and see anti-right anti -right to work there uh, as early as August and, and September of 1978. Some of us uh, tried to just give that a bit of a more organized character. And uh, from uh, mainly in the south part of Missouri, the uh, American agricultural movement was very helpful in um, organizing with steel workers in particular, uh, farmer worker caravans into the county seats. I prepared some of the literature there. Um, farmers then in both the AAM and uh, the NFO were circulating leaflets at the time in their own for their own purposes, uh, calling for parity, for full parity. And uh, the leaflets would break down uh, loaves of bread into uh, uh, the various costs and the, uh, showing how, how, small, uh, an how small a factor in the increase of a price of bread uh, and increase in farm product prices uh, was. Uh, that was for the consumers, and we did leaflets uh, breaking down the uh, price of a tractor in the same way. And I was uh, happy just to be able to write about the harvester strike, uh, Don, um, and send it to a lot of my farm friends, my dairy farm friends that I grew up with in Vermont, uh, to show how the shoddy tractors coming out of harvester now uh, with all kinds of uh, teeth lying in the bottom of gearboxes are a function of uh, speed up and job overloading and taking inspectors off the line and snatching uh, repair tags off of uh, flawed tractors rather than uh, any kind of shoddy craftsmanship on the part of workers. So uh, these two organizations in particular, AAM and uh, NFO, were extremely helpful. And uh, uh, I worked mainly in the northern fields of Missouri. And with the help of the NFO, uh, went around to see uh, a number of farmers uh, about the right to work issue. And uh, that's where I got my education in trade unionism. I just want to read you a few things that they said, which we then put into print and got into uh, thousands, tens of thousands of farm uh, households throughout Missouri, as well as uh, what they said when we had them come to farmer worker rallies in county seats. This is a farmer named uh, Reuben Heldenbrand in Gallatin, Missouri. 
Farmers aren't going anywhere if we try to tear the working man down. We've got to pick our own selves up. You've got the Chamber of Commerce, the Farm Bureau, and the big corporations who think this country would be better without unions. Why? Because they have a cheap food policy. To make a cheap food policy work, they've got to do two things. Destroy organized labor and keep farmers divided. And Don Hill in Lebanon, Missouri, if farmers are going to get a price for their products, they've got to rely on working people. And that means people with enough money to buy what the farmers want to sell. That's why your right to work laws are so dangerous. Uh, farmer uh, Melvin Marvin Sloop in California, Missouri. I remember when we had no organized labor. Haircuts cost 15 cents, but people couldn't buy haircuts. Shoes cost 250 a pair, but no one bought shoes. Hogs sold for 265 a hundredweight, but you couldn't sell a hog. Why? Because there they weren't paying near enough wages in the cities. And went on like that. And uh, what happened was that uh, fanning out from our contacts with uh, farmers, uh, the farmers themselves uh, carried the movement to the rest of the farm population in Missouri, saw that uh, uh, the labor movement in the cities and the, uh, the farm movement in uh, rural Missouri had to come together on this. And what was originally polled as a smashing victory for uh, right to work went down by some 900,000 to uh, 600,000 votes in November of 1968. It was uh, really a tremendous victory, uh, one which I wish the labor movement was repaying. Not that that's the basis of things, just repaying, because there's more to it than that. Um, but uh, the labor movement does owe a debt to the farm movement in Missouri. And I wish uh, more of that uh, debt was being recognized and repaid today. I do think that uh, that recognition will grow. And uh, while the uh, union is not what it was uh, back in the days of the, uh, uh, when Don first came in and helped form a union, you must have you'd been there before it started, uh, in, is not what it was in recognizing the class interests between farmers and, uh, and workers and other people in the population. I think the recognition is beginning to grow in the UAW and, and in many other unions, steel workers, teamsters, and so forth. I'm very hopeful uh, about the future. And I don't, when I didn't, when I went into Missouri, and even less so now, have the hunkered down view of the, of the new right wing is coming, the new right wing is coming. Uh, I just want to conclude on an optimistic quote from the Chinese. Um, and uh, just a brief statement before I do that. Uh, one of the uh, most revered speakers at this uh, conference, this symposium, talked about about the uh, wondrous changes in China between 1927 when he was there at one point and I think around 1972 at another where starvation was unknown the second time around and thousands have been dying in the streets the first time uh, where many infectious diseases were laying people low the first time and almost none when he went back and uh, I might add prostitution was common people simply had to sell their their daughters into it back in the 20s and it's uh, virtually unknown in China. The one thing he neglected to, to point out was that in the intervening years, a small event had occurred, uh, which was the Chinese Revolution. And out of that revolution came a saying which uh, uh, encourages uh, me in everything. And I had in mind when I went into Missouri, the road is tortuous, but the future is bright. And I think we'll all pull together with that. Now, if anyone has any uh, questions or discussion, if they move uh, toward the microphones. We've got a few minutes left here. I would like to call uh, to the microphone uh, a longtime farm organizer and uh, a guy that knows a lot about struggle. John Ennisvit. John, could you come up to the microphone? John uh, worked for many years in the Farmers Holiday Association and uh, the Farmer Labor Party and uh, the Young farm, Farmer Labor Rights. And John, could you tell us a few of your personal experiences in those organizations? I just wanted to briefly point out that <coughs> I just wanted to briefly point out that uh, 
in those days <coughs> it was more or less a crusade. And so you talk about the differences of the many people toward the farmer labor movement, you have to remember that <coughs> we came out of many uh, sort of varied uh, things. And so we worked together because we were separating ourselves from the old party, <coughs> old uh, uh, boss partyism, and we were adopting, for instance, a, a, a part of the Constitution in the state where you could vote for the people you wanted in the primaries rather than to be decided at the caucuses. So, of course, they're back to the caucuses now. So I kind of want to point this out. And so we set up, we had a farmer labor cooperative council, for instance, and this tended to, to, uh, to uh, attract uh, or make for uh, working people and in the city and in, on the, in the country to work together uh, with the, the cooperatives and uh, leaders. And in those days, the cooperative leaders uh, basically came out of North Dakota. And so you had uh, old Joe Gilbert, for instance, who was uh, in jail during the fir First World War for his opposition to the First World War, along with Townley, and, and if you, uh, some of you will remember that uh, old Joe Gilbert uh, came to this country as a confirmed socialist from England, and, and uh, with made many of the, uh, he, he was a theoretician for, uh, for the uh, nonpartisan league in, in many respects. So then we had, <coughs> like I said, we had the Farmer Labor Cooperative Council, and then we had, then of course, and we had the Junior Farmer Labor Rights, and which which I was a part of more so than, and then we, and then along came the Farmers Holiday Association, and and then later on, of course, we had WPA, and we got jobs in that, but we had this Farmer Labor Organization, and I I, I say more Farmer Labor Association because. You could belong to the Farmer Labor Party if you were a member of either a farm organization, a cooperative, or a trade union. So you see, these, uh, they, uh, this, uh, was, uh, this was the sort of the way this thing was brought together. So consequently, when, when, uh, when the Farmer Labor uh, uh, movement came in and then uh, 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 the New Deal came in and all that, well then you, and then it's uh, also started an adult education program for in the rural areas and a, and, and uh, <coughs> workers education movement in the in the, in the uh, cities so uh, they uh, the farmer labor uh, people in the state are working together with the uh, uh, well the De uh, national democratic party at that of course time because uh, the democrats didn't have any uh, influence in the state. Then <coughs> these, uh, the tra farm organization leaders and the trade union leaders, they nominated the people or f um, uh, submitted names that would be appointed uh, to uh, participate in this in-service training institute uh, for, for working people in the city as well as, uh, um, also I call ourselves working people in the country. We were, we, we, were, we were asked to come in by these farm uh, leaders and la trade union leaders and so we, to this in-service uh, training institute and for six weeks we were taught how to teach and organize and well we knew a little bit about organizing already. But we were taught these things because uh, that way they were sure that the right kind of people are people who could mi uh, mix with the people in the rural areas and in among the trade unions were people that uh, came out of these. So we had a good edu adult education and we had good workers' education. And I, I think this is the kind of thing I want to bring out. So what it was was a, a movement uh, that was coming up out of the grassroots, you might say, and this became the basis for, uh, for, for uh, the young people that were active in the Farmers' Holiday Association and, and so on and so forth. Well, I became an organizer, and since it was kind of a crusade, I became an organizer. I was organizer for the Farmers Holiday Association. I was organizer for Federal Workers Section of 544. I was also organizing for, organizer for the Unemployed Teachers Union, and 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 the Junior Junior Farmer Labor Rights. You see, so you, you you were on a crusade, and 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 this this went on, and and and, and this built up the relationship between working people in the city and us out in the country so that we could work together and the strike was on 
for instance, a, a Teamster strike. We, we, it was very simple to go out in the country. We went out and, and we could collect food and bring in and so on. And I, I think that's about all I have to add. Thank you. Thank you, John. We've got uh, just a little time for a couple of brief questions or statements. Ma'am? Thank you. I'd like to add a touch of frosting to uh, Brother Teiglin's cake. Uh, his union, in the period when the strike was going on in the harvester union, uh, a little short of cash. And uh, so they got one of their eloquent organizers and sent him down to Oklahoma where the National Farmers Union Convention was going on. And the uh, president of the union, Patton, didn't say he couldn't speak, but he put him on at the worst possible time. It'd be almost like putting somebody on after the next session when everybody's all tired and wanting to leave. That'd be a fine time to raise money, I'm sure. Well, he put him on on the last morning, first speaker, when uh, not everybody was there. Well, he took it, began to speak. And uh, he spoke of the harvester strike. He spoke of the workers in the plant. And he kind of made a hit when he said, and as far as the McCormick family, that whole family has emblazoned on its escutcheon nuts. You know, some of them are in the asylum. So uh, that was appreciated by the farmers who paid too much for their, for their machinery. And uh, then a f delegate from Texas got up. And he says, that's a pretty good fella. I'm going to sell a steer and give the money to the union. Well, that started an avalanche. And before it got done, they'd raised $6,000 and turned it over to this guy. And he went back to the union a hero. And the only trouble is, Don, I've forgotten the name of the guy who did that. You know? No, I... Maybe it was Jerry Fields. I'm not he sure. Okay, about one more question. Uh, like Lem, I'm just going to make a brief comment rather than a question. I do wish that Dr. O'Connell had been able to be here for the nonpartisan league session in particular because I think it was one of our better ones. And I wish he'd been here this morning for the farm strike session because that was a pretty good one too. Uh, he mentions the great cooperation between the farm holiday and Floyd B. Olson in Minnesota. And I, under I think you underestimate the strength of that cooperation between Floyd B. Olson and the Farm Holiday Association. John Bush has told me how uh, uh, he just had to call Floyd Olson up and stop a sheriff's sale. And so Minnesota was not the first state to have the governor uh, proclaim a mortgage moratorium. Governor Schmiedemann was of Wisconsin issued one early in January. He was followed by Herring of Iowa. He was followed by Charlie Bryan, of all people, of Nebraska. He was followed by Wild Bill Langer of North Dakota, who, being Wild Bill Langer, called out the militia to stop uh, mortgage foreclosures. Floyd B. Olson was one of the last governors to uh, issue a uh, mortgage moratorium, and I think it was probably because his cooperation because he cooperated so well with the farm holiday. Also, Minnesota was just about the last state to pass a mortgage moratorium law. He was last in both of those cases. Thanks. Do you mind if I make a brief comment on that? <laughs> I, I, think, I think I can sort, sort of explain why we were kind of the last ones to adopt the mortgage moratorium act. Or because we had a very effective holiday movement, and I, I'm sure uh, Roy will bear me out on this, we had very effective uh, negotiating committees in all counties, and we made it a practice that if anybody asked us to stop their mortgage for closer sale, we had already educated many sheriffs, and they, they learned not to defy us because uh, if, if we called in and said we didn't want the sale for close, they would, uh, they would uh, you, many of them, or most of them would go along with us in our area. So, and, and we made it a point <laughs> that if when it was refinanced, when the farm was refinanced, it had to be refinanced according to uh, the rules and regulations laid down by the federal land banks who would refinance their markets at 70% of its appraised valuation. So this was a, there wasn't that much struggle, you must understand. 
it, it, uh, we were doing this, and uh, there wasn't quite that pressure to, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, um, um, outlaw uh, mortgage foreclosures in Minnesota. There wasn't in other states. And I think this is the main reason. I'm glad I had the experience to help stop out of sales. One thing that I should have added, uh, these strikers were broke, and so were the farmers, but beef wasn't worth anything, hogs weren't worth anything, and Swift County, out of my town of Benson, we sent five or six truckloads, that was Model T and Model A truckloads, of, of uh, quarters of beef and halves of beef and uh, canned goods that the women had canned, and uh, we give them a lot of things, and this was really appreciated. There was cooperation. Well, I guess that'll about do it for this session. I think we've had a real good panel here. I think we should give them a hand.